Come on, church. Such a beautiful day to give God praise, to say you are worthy of it all. You may take a seat. Um, we're just so glad we're here. It's, it's been a while, and it's been in the works to come to Michigan for me for the very first time in the state of Michigan uh, to worship with you. And um, my wife and I uh, get the honor of just doing that today and seeing what God has been doing here in this city and through pastors, uh, Pastor John and Cece, and what they're doing here in the north. I just want to let you know and reiterate it. It's not normal. It's special. It takes a pastor with dedication and grit and commitment to say, I am going to plant a, tr a church here in the state of Michigan, in the area of Detroit, and I'm going to stay, and I'm going to be planted, and I'm going to be rooted, and I'm going to reach the people of this city, how God has called me to reach the city. And so just wanted to honor them and the way they've been to, to me and my wife and my family, not just tangible investment, which that's been incredible to see, but just a voice of encouragement and uh, just checking in, getting a voice memo from Pastor John. Hey, how's everything going? Um, it's amazing. And yes, we did meet at a pastor's gathering, and uh, I know he was making a joke out of it, but I absolutely enjoyed it. And uh, I think I did tell him a little too much on our first meet. But if you know Pastor John, you know it. Like, he's all in. Like, he meets you and he's all in. And I'm like, I'm, I'm going to be all in too. And then after our conversation, I was like, okay. Like, that was a lot. Um, but I feel good. <laughs> I think I've made a friend. Um, and so since that... Um, it's just been great being able to build the partnership and the relationship. And I'm so glad we get to be here finally. And I just want to shout out, we got some of our launch team in Athens, Georgia, or Athens, Georgia watching, which is fantastic. If y'all would just wave at them, that'd be awesome. Um, we're so glad y'all are tuning in. Um, love you guys so much. And I know my kiddos are there too. Uh, and saying that, I want to introduce you to my beautiful family. I know they have a picture. Um, there's... There's our family. It's a family of seven, and um, we absolutely love this, this incredible, chaotic, ordered mess that's a beautiful mess and uh, that God has blessed us with. But uh, my wife is here, Brittany. Um, she's right here in the front. Um, and I tell everyone what she's, like, what she's like, and when they ask that, I'm like, she's just beautiful and she's bold. And that's it. And she's a bold woman of God and uh, my better half. And, but I have the, our five kiddos here, Nasia, Bethel, Malachi, Skye, and Tiago. Uh, three girls, two boys. Uh, pray more for this little one right here. Um, she's joyful and a handful at the same time. Um, <laughs> she just needs Jesus. Um, that's <laughs> Let me seal this moment with prayer, and I would love to share the word that God has deposited um, in my heart. Lord God, thank you for who you are. Thank you that we get to come to your house in your presence and experience something supernatural. God, we don't want to take this moment for granted. We thank you, God, for the people of God that gets to gather and worship you and give you praise and watch you move so wonderful in our lives. And Lord, right now, I want to speak against any distraction, anything, God, that happened last night or this morning that may keep us away from hearing your word and experiencing your love and grace in a fresh way. God, I, I just speak it in this moment that your spirit is tangible in this place. Do your work. Do what only you can do. Speak to me, God, and speak through me. And I pray that your word pierces the hearts and that people leave transformed today. That minds are shifted. That perspectives are different because of who you are. 
and your love and your grace and your mercy. In Jesus' name, and everyone say, amen, amen. amen. Um, you guys doing okay today? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm so excited to share uh, what God has placed in my heart. And before I go any further, though, um, I want to say it in an in a honoring way. The scripture we're about to talk to or talk about, um, it's about Peter walking on water. And I know us going to church, you're probably sitting in the room saying, hey, I've heard that hundreds of times. Hey, I've heard plenty of those messages, and that's okay. Um, but if you're hearing it for the first time, I want to speak to that person and also speak to you, saying, remove any preconceived notion that you have heard about the Scripture, any of your ideas or opinions or anything that brought you up to where you are now and how many times you've heard it, not because I'm going to preach it the best, but just because I want you to experience a fresh, fresh revelation of what God has for you this morning. And I want to be able to speak it the way God has deposited in me. And the revelation that's given to me, I pray that it's helpful for you today as well. And so we're going to be speaking out of Matthew 14, verses 22 through 29. Again, Peter walking on water. And so verses 22 starts, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat was already a considerable distance from land buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. Again, I just want to emphasize that verse 25 says, During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. I'm going to pause there. It's not my message, but as I was praying for you this week, that stood out. Because if you do a little digging and, and go back, it says that Jesus dismissed them and then evening came. Which means when they were dismissed, afternoon, right, ish, then evening came and it said Jesus didn't show up until the fourth watch of the night. And I may be speaking to some of you today before we even go any further that you're feeling a little tired and that it seemed like it's been evening in your life for far too long. It's dark. It feels like I've been in it too long. Jesus, where are you? And if you do a little bit of research, you understand that fourth watch means it's coming into morning. And I want to speak to you today for you feeling like I'm in a dark place and I've been there far too long. I feel alone. God, where are you? I'm praying it doesn't seem like it's coming to pass. That I pray to you that there's new mercies every morning. There's new mercies for you every morning. And I pray that Today, this Sunday morning, it's a fourth watch type of Sunday. Are you with me with that? Can you believe that it's a fourth watch type of Sunday for me? Meaning, it may be dark, but today, I'm gaining my faith back, and I'm giving God my trust again. I'm gaining my faith back, and God, I'm giving you my trust Again, And so we pick up verse 26. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. They said, it's a ghost and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Verse 28, Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. 
Peter said, not just come out of this boat and jump out of the boat, but I'm going to go a little deeper. Jesus, tell me to come out on the water. That's, that's a little different than, let me just jump and swim to you, right? Peter had this boldness to him that can only mean one thing, that he was trusting the voice of his Savior. And if he said, come, I'm willing to trust. Not just trust, but trust boldly. And so Jesus said one word. He said, come. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on water, and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sing, cried out, Lord, save me. Peter got down out of the boat and walked on the water. Before we even go any further today, what is God asking you to come out of that's been holding on to you so you can experience what God has for you? It's a way of saying, I am completely surrendering to your will. Let your will be done. And I'm going to come out of the water and do this. This is my first point to you. If he called you to the unfamiliar, it's because he's expecting you to experience the unfamiliar. If he called you to something that seems unfamiliar in your life today, in the season of life you're in, it's because he wants you to experience the unfamiliar. But it's hard to experience something you don't know. And, and this is how I know. <laughs> we, we are parents of five kiddos, but as the kids were younger, um, we wanted them to learn how to swim. We just wanted them to fall in love with water. I mean, I grew up at the beach. Uh, Brittany, my wonderful wife, grew up at the lake. We all know beach is better than the lake. We just know that. Let's get it out there. It's okay, I can say that. Um, there's alligators at the lake. I mean, we grew up in Florida. I'm like, what? You can't even see below this water. This is terrible. Yes, I know, you're like Sammy, but there's sharks and jellyfish. I know, but we're okay. We're okay. The beach is better than the lake. We just know that. But I just wanted our kiddos to enjoy water. And so I remember we would take them out to the pool, and they would be standing at the edge of the pool, and I would be in the water, so excited. New dad, I'm like, jump in. And they're so tiny. I'm like, come on, you can do it. And they're looking at me and just staring at me. And they're like, no. <laughs> and they distance themselves, right? I'm like, no, 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 come back, come back, come back. I got you. Jump in. Daddy is right here. And they're like, no. And I would get so frustrated, y'all. I'm like, you better jump into this pool right now. <laughs> right? It's like, I need you to learn how to swim. I need you to love the water, God's beautiful creation. <laughs> right? Yes, a silly story. But more serious when you're actually walking it out. Because studying this scripture and preparing for this sermon I now realize back then why they were so hesitant to jump in. For them, standing at the edge of the pool, what was on the other side was unfamiliar. I don't understand that. I don't know what will happen when I jump in. Yes, Dad, you're saying jump in. Are you close enough to catch me? Can I trust that what you say is true? Can I completely understand that if I jump in right now, I won't drown or sink, that you're close enough? Dad, what you're saying is that true? Again, silly story, but plenty of times in life, we walk through life limited from experiences experiencing the miracles that God has for us because we are stuck in our familiarity, unwilling to step into the unfamiliar things that God has for us. And this 
is a story of obedience. I know it's hard. I know it's difficult. Because when we decide to be obedient, we think it's just like a natural feeling. We're like, we're going to be obedient. Everything is going to be okay. Right? It's so easy to say, I'm going to be obedient until you are. (laughs) I'm going to be so obedient now. God, you mean that? Because the thing about obedience is it does not remove the obstacles from your life. But it does provide you opportunities for for experiencing the miracles that God has for you. Doesn't remove the obstacles, but provides the opportunities for what's on the other side. And the thing is, experiencing unfamiliar will be something you cannot comprehend because it's unfamiliar. It's immeasurably more than I can ask, think, or imagine. You haven't stepped into it yet. But will you trust God at one word? Will you go back to the first word I heard from God? Sammy, you mean the unfamiliar, the dad that will put his phone down and not be sucked into the pressure, but be present with his kids? Yes, the unfamiliar. Sammy, you mean the mom that I am authentic and real with other moms that I don't have to put on a facade and feel like everything is okay and write the beautiful captions on Instagram. Can I tell you, it's fake and God wants to reel you, not the fake you. Yes, the unfamiliar. Sammy, you mean me as a young adult being set apart, being in the world but not of it? Yes. The unfamiliar. The thing is, though, it's hard to step into the unfamiliar. You know why? Because we get so tied to our tradition. And our tradition becomes our belief system. So when God says, I want you to experience a breakthrough, he's asking you, I need you to break through your belief system to experience what I have for you. And that comes from life experiences. That comes from opinions and how I grew up. We get stuck in the traditions of this is just the way it is. Sammy, this is how I grew up. So why are you telling me to step into something I have no clue what it's going to look like? The unfamiliar, this is how I learned how to love people. If they look like us, talk like us, you mean I'm supposed to love despite being loved? I'm supposed to love despite the chaos and the hate? The unfamiliar. Are you so stuck with your burden of your own beliefs that you can't see the breakthrough that God has in front of you? The unfamiliar, yes, I know, I know it's difficult. And I'm sure Peter had a hard time too. You see, Peter was a fisherman. And so for me, I know Peter knew a lot about fishing. I mean, he wasn't the best fisherman though. Don't give him that much credit. There was a time in scripture that Jesus walked up on his boat and said, you should cast your net on the other side. And Peter said, what? I've been here all day. How are you going to tell me how to fish? And Jesus basically said, yeah, I know. That's why you need me, right? So cast your net on the other side and you'll experience what I have for you. What you may not be able to see yet but the unfamiliar step that you need to take in your life to know and trust that I am good to you. That God loves you too much and cares deeply enough to ask you to take the unfamiliar step so you can continue to experience the miracles that he has for you. Think of the miracles that we miss because we're stuck in our familiarity. God, do something amazing in my life. Take the step. 
but I want to stay here. You see, Peter knew everything there was about fishing. He wasn't a great fisherman, but he knew that. And the thing about him not being a great fisherman was what attracted Jesus to him. And can I tell you today, your inadequacy and your insecurity is what attracts Jesus to you. Not you saying, I need to have it all together. I need to be the best put together dad. I will never raise my voice. I'm sorry, I failed at that. I need to be buttoned up and all good to go. God sent a perfect son to die for the imperfect you. You don't have to be put together. Your imperfection attracts Jesus. Because who you aren't is who he is. And what you need is what he has. And what you don't need is what he has. And so you're serving an illogical God. Stop trying to make sense of it all. God is not logical. He's not two plus two equals four. He's illogical. He's the same God that told Moses, raise the staff and I will split the Red Seas. And so it was split. He's the same God that told David, just pick up a few pebbles and I'm going to send you to a battlefield with Goliath and you will defeat it because you are a man after my own heart. That same God. The same God that asked Noah to build the ark because a flood was coming and Noah said, I have no clue what a flood was. That same God, the same God that said, I'm sending my son to an imperfect world to die for imperfect people because I love them that much that I'm willing to send my one and only begotten son to die for their sins, their shame, their guilt, but not just stay in the grave, rise again so they can know that they can receive new life and after that ascend to the heavenly father and send down his Holy Spirit to live in you and I so they can be our helper and guide us and develop the conviction in us that illogical God cares deeply enough to tell you, take the unfamiliar step and I will meet you where you are. The thing is, though, a lot of times what happens to us is what happened to Peter. You see, Peter was walking on water at that time, but then he saw the wind and felt the waves. He was focused, but his sight shifted. The wind and the waves caused that. But can I give you a second point? Because I think this part of the scripture gets a bad rep is that if God called you, use the wind in your favor. If God called you, use the wind in your favor. Sammy, you mean I just lost my job. Use that in my favor? Sammy, you mean my kids that I'm praying for daily that I'm training them in the way they should go. They're not in church today, and I'm praying that one day they will come to church. You mean use that in my favor? The doctor noticed and the the news that I just received that got me to a dark place. You mean use that in my favor? Yes. Yes. This is the reason why the wind gives your miracle meaning. This is what I wish the body of believers would do once they started seeing the wind and feeling the waves and know that I took a step because of his word, not my word. And the reason I was able to walk in the unfamiliarity of life and experience immeasurably more for my life is because I never stepped 
on water. I just stepped on his word. And his word is more than enough for me. And so Peter is here. Jesus is there. And he's looking at Jesus following one word, come. And he feels the waves and sees the wind. I wish he would have done this. Take long strides towards Jesus. I wish we would do that as body of believers, that we would sprint towards Jesus because we start feeling some obstacles. We start feeling some resistance. And we're like, Jesus is right there. I'm okay if I just run towards him. Instead, we're like, oh, no. Because the enemy would rather use the wind for your distraction. But God will use the wind to remind you of your destiny, that it is in his hand, not in yours. And so the way he uses the miracles in your life is to help you understand that your life is not your own. This story is not about Peter. This story is about Jesus. And we can go to Sunday school classes and sing to our kids, your whole world, right? The whole world is in his hands. The whole world, right? I'm not going to do it right now. I'm not Pastor John. I can't sing. But (laughs) we sing it. It's hard to believe it. Because we can say God has the whole universe in his hand, but does he really have my life? Can I trust him with my life, with what I'm going through today? So the question to you is, where has your faith gone? Has your faith lost some focus in this season of life? Are you struggling in the area of trust in your relationship with you and God? And you giving God your trust again gets you to that intimate space, that relationship with Jesus between you and him, that it's beautiful to know that he is for you, he is with you, he will never leave you or forsake you. And church, the word never means never. He will never leave you or forsake you. You've come too far to give up now. And so the wind has two objectives. It can push you back away from God's promises. Or it can propel you forward into who God has called you to be. What is it going to be today? Use the wind in your favor. The thing is, God is not asking us to walk this life in a controlled environment. Scripture tells us, in this life you will have trouble, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. Meaning, you may not be walking through life in a controlled substance, in a controlled environment, but it's because I want you to know that what you experience in in life is not because of your own doing. It's because of me working in you and through you. You see, I love running. And a couple months ago, I was training for a 5K. And I got so excited. I was like, let's go. My 5K is coming up. And um, we had just moved into Athens. I was like, this is perfect. Get to enjoy Athens and, and run. And the thing is, though, it's two months of training, and I did it all on the treadmill. I know, I know. Um, It felt so great. Got the AC. I mean, I was like, okay, I can go high. Okay, I can go low. Okay, the speed. Okay, slow it down. Um, I could take a break and drink water and come back to it. It just felt good. I'm like, this training is going fantastic. And the day before the run, I did the whole entire 5K, and I was able to finish it in 21 minutes, and I got out of that gym like, let's go. And then the, the, the day of the, the race came. <laughs> and I woke up and it was raining. 
And I looked at my email right away. I was like, I hope they canceled it. I really hope they can. No, it was still on. So I was like, okay, let's get in the car. Let's go. I get there. I get out of the car and it's humid. And I am sweating before I even get to the starting line. I'm like, God, what is this? What am I putting myself through right now? And then I get to the starting place and I'm running with a friend and he's 19. And I looked at him and I said, just go. Okay, like, just go. And he was like, you sure? I was like, yeah, I was 19 once. And I ran with people that were older, and they looked at me and always said, just go. And now I know why they said that. (laughs) And so the race started, and I'm going, and halfway in, I thought I was going to die. I said, I'm going to have to stop. But then I was like, no, my kids are watching. This is for my family. (laughs) And so I was like, maybe I'll just slow down a bit and and jog, but I got to keep going. And then, y'all, like 0.5 miles away from the finish line, I'm coming through a corner, going up the hill, and I hit the curve, and uh, a bunch of elementary girls came by, and they just passed me. And one of them goes, let's get it. And (laughs) And I thought to myself, wow, I am humbled, and uh, now I really need to finish. And all the elementary teachers are like, go, girls. And I'm like, yes, go, girls. Um, And so I finished the race. Yes, I did finish the the race. It was great. I did it. And um, I saw my wife, and she came up to me, and she said, hey, didn't you tell me you wanted to break a record for this race? And, and in the moment in my mind, I was like, is she about to shame me right now? Because that's not cool. Um, but then she looked at me and she said, hey, you broke it by a minute. And I thought to myself, really? And um, I say that story to tell you that right away in my mind, I started thinking of every time I could have gave up. I could have thrown in the towel when the hills became too hilly, when the water was never in sight, when people were passing me and I thought, am I ever going to finish this? When I thought maybe I should walk or just sit, but I thought to myself, no, I gotta finish. Basically, I am telling you that in your uncontrolled environment, You are running a race, not for this worldly treasure, but for a heavenly treasure. And God has called you to run a race that he is with you and that he's called you to run. And there's a meaning to your miracle. And so you've come too far to throw in the towel. You've prayed too long to give up on your prayer now. You've believed too much to stop believing now. He loves you too much to turn his back on you. And so this leads me to my last point. If he called you, it means he'll catch you. Church, if he called you, he will catch you. You mean all the things I've gone through my past that seems to follow me everywhere I go, the struggles that I have, the failures that I've gone through, he's ready to catch me? Yes. You know why I know? I've felt the touch, the grip of his hand in this church planting process way too much that I can stand here and let you know that he is one reach away. And he's ready to catch you. He's ready to catch you. Sir, you with the glasses, can you come here? Yes. Peter is walking towards Jesus. And while he's walking towards Jesus, Jesus had been walking towards him the entire time. You've come too far by faith to stop now. You've come too far by faith to stop now. And he's too true to his promise 
to not do what he says. And what happened, it says in scripture, Peter cried out, Lord, save me. And as soon as Peter reached out his hand, Jesus did that. Can I tell you today, your voice is valuable to God's ear. Your cry is exactly what he's waiting to hear. There's some of you in this place today that you have gone silent way too long. I am going to do this on my own. I am going to push through it. I'm, I'm, I'm designed to just do it the way I need to do it. I don't need God's hand or help in my life. You've gone to it far too long, staying way too silent. And God says, I want to hear your cry. Peter cried out to God. Jesus responded. His doubt caused him to drown. God's grace caught him. His doubt caused him to begin to sink. Jesus' grace caught him. And so I'm telling you in this place today, wherever you've been, the prayers that's gone unanswered, Am I really supposed to step into the unfamiliar spaces of my life and see God do incredible, immeasurably more in my life? Sammy, if I feel the winds and the waves, am I really supposed to run towards the one who can? Yes, and I need you to cry out for help. He's right there to catch you. Thank you. And the thing is, there's this time at the house with my kids that I do the trust fall. And my, my seven-year-old is like the best at it, Sky. Um, he'll, she'll just go and just, I'm, I'm, I'm not even ready. <laughs> right? But I would say, go, and she goes, and I catch her. And I say, go, and she, she falls, and I, I catch her. Go, she falls, I catch her. Church, you gain your trust in a completely different way when you know your heavenly father is the one catching you. If I can stand behind my own daughter and catch her, how much more will your God do for you? Me and my imperfect self, a dad that doesn't have it all together, willing and able to catch my daughter. How much more can God do for you? The catch from Jesus, the most beautiful exchange for me in scripture. You know why? Because he broke the distance. He broke the distance for your depression. He broke the distance for your anxiety. He broke the distance for your inaccuracy. Inaccuracy. He broke the distance for you not being good enough. He broke the distance, I am too sinful. He broke the distance, I am too shameful. He broke the distance, I am too guilty. He broke the distance saying, I am here for you and I'm the savior you've needed. This entire time, he broke the distance because you're valuable to him. Sammy, can I really trust him? Will he really catch me? Yes. You know why? Because his grace is sufficient for you. His grace never runs out. Doesn't mean we abuse his grace. We just know there's a bigger purpose for our lives. His grace is sufficient for you. In Romans I love this scripture, Romans 3, 23. It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. You are called by Christ. I've fallen short. Peter fell short. You've fallen short. But God... But grace has caught you. 
And so the way I want you to leave out of this place today is, God, I am giving you my trust again because I've gotten my faith back. I've gotten my faith back. And I can trust that when I step into unfamiliar things, when I feel the wind and the waves, that your hand is right there. You're one reach away. Church, if you can stand up with me. You've come too far by faith to stop now. You see, God called you. The thing is, is you're called dot, dot, dot. It's what happens after you're called. In that moment of questions, your dot, dot, dot becomes your doubt. The dot, dot, dot becomes, am I good enough? I'm not seeing anything come to pass. God, have you really called me? Do you have something more for my life? Can I encourage you today? No matter your age, no matter your race, no matter your life experience, no matter your failures, no matter how good you are, God's right there. And so I want to speak to you in the room today that have gone too long winning the world but forfeiting their soul to know that your God is with you. Your God is for you. And so church, if you would just turn your hands up towards heaven and lift your hands, palms up and receive what God has for you today. Maybe I'm speaking to you today that you're like, I just need the peace of God to transcend all understanding. Can I challenge you with that though? That means you have to remove your understanding to experience God's peace. It transcends all understanding. Don't let your understanding be the barrier between you and God's miracle for you. And so, God, I speak over every single person in this room today. I pray, God, that your word is piercing through the hearts. God, I pray for peace in this place. God, that they know that who is for them is greater than what's against them. That, Lord, you've called them. You've chosen them. They're called righteous and holy. They are your prized possession. And so as they lift up their hands, I pray that they receive the faith that's reignited in a fresh new way today and that they are releasing their trust to you, God, saying, I trust you. I trust your word. I trust your grace. I trust your mercy. I trust your favor. I trust your anointing over my life. I trust you with my job, my family, my friendships, my relationship, that God, they will surrender it to you. Thank you, God, that faith is believing in who called us. But God, trust is believing in the ability of who called us. And so, God, we want to continually surrender to your will and your way. And right now, to anyone that's sitting in this place and you're saying, how can I trust someone if I never have gotten in a relationship with them? And you're saying, how can I commit my life to someone I've never accepted into my life? I, know, I don't know this person you're talking about because I don't have an intimate relationship with him. Can I tell you in scripture, Romans says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that he is the savior of the world, you will be saved. And so if you're sitting in this room today and that's you, we're going to pray a prayer collectively as a church. And this is your moment to say, God, I've done it far too long on my own. I'm giving you my life. And I choose to follow you. 
So church, repeat after me. Say, dear Jesus, I give you my life. Thank you for dying for my sins, my shame, and my guilt. Thank you for raising from the dead and giving me new life. From this day forward, I choose to live for you for the rest of my days. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you're in here this morning, come on, church. We're celebrating with you for giving your life to Christ. There's not a better decision that you will ever make other than the one you just did today. So, Lord God, I thank you for what you've done in this place. I thank you for the word that you've given us. I thank you that your promise is true. I thank you that your word is a solid foundation. And I pray that this week, God, that you'll continue to reveal to them who you are specifically to them and how you've called them to take unfamiliar steps, how you've called them to run towards you in the midst of the wind, in the midst of the miracle, because you're not distant, you're close. And God, I pray that they will declare with a desperate declaration needing you in their life and knowing you will catch them time and time again. God, we love you. We thank you. It's an honor to serve you and worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.